Well, this morning, as we continue our season of Advent, we're going to talk about love. And uh, love, if, if you've ever been, well, if you've if you breathe the air, you've heard people talk about love, right? I mean, everybody has an idea of what love is. Uh, you know, a group of kids were asked what love is, what they thought it was, and here's some of their responses. First of all, Glenn, age seven, says, if falling in love is anything like learning how to spell, I don't want to do it. <laughs> it takes too long. Uh, John, age nine, says, love is like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. <laughs> Regina says, I'm not rushing into being in love. I'm finding fourth grade hard enough. <laughs> Good idea, Regina. Christine says, love is when two people order one of those desserts that are on fire. They like to order those because it's like how their hearts are on fire. That's cute, isn't it? You know, when we talk about love, the dictionary also defines love as a warm, personal attachment or deep affection. A warm, personal attachment or deep affection. So I can say, I love guacamole. <laughs> I have a deep affection for guacamole. Or I love, I love this church. Or I love my wife. But I do not love my wife the way I love guacamole. Let's be clear on that. I mean, I would give my life for guacamole. <laughs> and my wife. But there's definitely something, I mean, we use that word in so many different ways when we talk about it. And, uh, you know, in the words of that great theologian, Tina Turner, the question is, what does love have to do with it? So other authors and artists and musicians have all tried for so long to define love. So beyond the, the children philosophers that we looked at before, here's one from Lemony Snicket in his uh, book, Horseradish, Bitter Truths You Can't Avoid. It says, love can change a person the way a parent can change a baby, awkwardly and often with a great deal of mess. Sad as it is, there's a lot of truth in that statement. Because it's not always neat and pretty and clean. It's sometimes it takes work and effort. Catherine Hepburn says, love has nothing to do with what you are expecting to get, only, what, only with what you are expecting to give, which is everything. And Fyodor Dostoevsky says, what is hell? I maintain that it is the suffering of being unable to love. See, love is central to so much of our lives and this desperate desire in each of us to be loved. And as we think of love this Christmas season, I want to turn to Psalm chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, turn over to Psalm chapter 8. And if uh, you don't have a Bible, there should be a pew Bible right in front of you, perhaps in the seat underneath you. Uh, it's on page 535, 535 in the pew Bible. Psalm chapter 8, beginning at verse 3. It says, When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you should care for him. Have you ever considered the heavens? I'm sure all of us at night at times have gone out to see the heavens. Perhaps you've been in a a secluded area, and you could look up and you could see the Milky Way. You know, one night, uh, our family, we went out to go see a meteor shower when we lived in California, so we went out and we were sitting in the darkest place you could around San Diego, at least in our town. It was this place called Santee Lakes. It's kind of an RV area, and so we went out and we were lying on the grass, and we were looking at the stars, and we heard the sound of <laughs> The sprinklers came on. But we've all had those moments where we want to go out and just admire the heavens. But stop for a minute and consider them. Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens. Did you know that the observable diameter of the universe is 93 billion light years? 
93 billion light years. A light year, you know, it's the distance a, that, light observable, uh, that light can travel in a year's time. One light year is almost six trillion miles. So the distance across the observable universe is 5.58 times 10 to the 23rd miles across. It's a lot of zeros after that. In the beginning, God created the heavens. The sun, the closest star to us, is 93 million miles away. It takes about 8.3 minutes for the light of the sun to reach us from the surface of the sun to the surface of the earth. The diameter of the sun is 864,938 miles. It's about 109 times greater the diameter of the earth. And it's so large that 1.3 million earths could fit inside of the sun. The heavens declare the glory of God. And we're told in Genesis that God created the heavens, and it says that, and the earth. The circumference of the earth, that is if you were to, you know, get, get bored, decide I'm going to walk around the equator. If you go out, walk around the equator, it's 24,901 miles The earth weighs, get this, 5.972 times 10 to the 21st. That's nearly six sextillion, there's a word for your vocabulary, sextillion, six sextillion tons. And here's what amazes me, is that little ball of six, six, of six sextillion tons just sits there hanging in space. Because, you know, if it were just a fraction closer to the sun, it would fry. A little bit further away, it would freeze. If it were tilted on its axis in the smallest amount, half of the planet would freeze and the other half would burn. And the heavens declare the glory of God. Back a few pages in your Bible, in the book of Job page 527 in the Pew Bible. After feeble attempts to understand the will of God by both Job's friend and Job himself, back in Job chapter 38. We'll pick up at verse 4. And we're going to read this for a while through verse 41. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation, the Lord asks. Brace yourself like a man, was what it said earlier. Tell me if you understand. Verse 5, who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the seas behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the past to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? Verse 24, what is the day... What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no one lives and an uninhabited desert to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father who fathers the drops of dew? 
from whose womb comes the ice, who gives birth to the frost from the heavens. When the water becomes hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen, can you bind the chains of Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? Or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the law of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds or cover yourself with the flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do you, they report to you, here we are. Who gives the ibis wisdom or gives the rooster understanding? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jar, jars of heaven when the dust becomes hard and the claws of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie and wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Who? Have you contemplated the heavens? Have you considered the greatness of creation? It just amazes me at times that people can see themselves as greater than this God who created the heavens and the earth. And that's really the point that God is making to Job and his friends. Like, you think you have understanding, but the truth is, is you are understanding is so limited. And so in Psalm 8, he says, When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you should be mindful of? This God who hung the earth in the heavens, who placed the, star, the sun, our star, in its place, who are we that God should be mindful of us? You see, God is omniscient. He's all-powerful. He's the God who created the heavens and the earth, and he can destroy them should he desire, but he doesn't. He created them that we might have life. It was a design created that we might live. He set the moon and the stars in place, and by the work of his fingers, everything is in place. He's omnipresent. That means there is no place that God is not. In the vastness of space or in the tiniest of spaces, God is there. From the depths of the sea to the heights of the mountains to the furthest galaxy, God is there. God is omniscient. He is omnipresent. Omni omnipotent is all-powerful. Omniscient is all-knowing. He's also eternal. God is, was there before time began. He set time into motion. Consider the brevity of your life. It's been, it's been described as one as if eternity were a cable that went around the earth. That cable, 24,901 miles long, and you took a pin and you scratched a line on it. That would be symbolic of the length of your life in comparison to eternity. And how great we make of ourselves. But the truth is, we can consider how tiny we are in comparison to the universe, to eternity, to God's power. And so, the question is, is what does love have to do with it? When you consider how great God is, you can't help but ask, what is mankind that God, you should be mindful of us. But here's the deal, is God is mindful of us. We're told in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? You know, we consider the birds as less important than us, and God cares for them, and he cares for you, this God of the universe, this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal God cares for you. 
in Matthew 6, 28 through 30. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? The God who clothed the heavens is concerned about clothing you. And so, Jesus tells us, there's no need to worry. Until we understand the vastness of God, we don't recognize the extent, the depths of God's love for us. Let's turn in our Bibles one more time over to the book of 1 John. That's in the New Testament towards the end, just before the book of Revelation. Page 1,209, if, you have your, if uh, you're using the Pew Bible, 1,209. 1 John chapter 4. Beginning at verse 9, it says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if you love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. You see, Jesus came for the express purpose of rescuing us. What we deserve for what we had done, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. But Jesus is atoned, and it says here that he came that he might atone for. That means he covered. He was the covering for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. Jesus came for that purpose of rescuing us, of saving us. And notice the language in verse 10. It says, this is love. For all that the poets and the songwriters, in all of their attempts to, dis- to define, to describe love, here it is. This is love. God sent his one and only son. Our response in verses 11 and 12. And since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and love is made complete in us. Don't miss what John is saying here. The eternal, the all-powerful, the everywhere present God entered into this world in the person of Jesus Christ sent his son on a rescue mission for us. And now you need to know what we need to do is to love others. No one has ever seen God, but when we love one another, in this world, we can see the effects of God. We can look at creation and say, there is God, but we have not seen God face to face. But what it says is this, When you love one another, they see God. You want to talk to people, say, well, I've never seen God. Have you seen him? Our answer should be yes. I've seen it in the love that we have for one another. That is the witness of God's existence is our love for one another. In this Advent season, We talk not just about the first advent of Christ. He came to a little manger in his first advent, a child. Get your mind around that. This God who holds the ball of earth in space, who is present to the uttermost parts of the galaxy, squeezed into the skin of a child, a baby in a manger. In Jesus, he was fully God. And he was fully man. Because 
as a human, he was tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. And because of that, he was able to pay the penalty for our sins. Where we couldn't live the kind of life that God demanded of us to be sinless perfection, he was able to do that. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he lived his life and overcame sin. The, po- the, 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 the eternality, the omnipresence, the omnipotence of God, all wrapped in the skin, the flesh of a child. And in that flesh, he grew in wisdom and knowledge and favor with God and man until the day he was hung on the cross for our sake. And that is his first advent, but we look forward to the second advent. The Bible tells us that Jesus will return again, coming in glory. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And this is another great testimony of God's love for us, is his patience. How many of us can say that we have the patience of God? God is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish. You know, the Lord could return at any moment. That's the promise of God's word to us, is at any moment the Lord could return. But here's what this verse is saying. In the expectation that these people had, that the Lord would return, he's saying, It's a good thing that God has not returned yet because in his patience, you were saved. In his patience, your family members may be saved. In his patience, your friends who do not know the Lord may be saved. He desires that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you have friends or family members who don't know Jesus, there will be a day when he does return and their fate will be sealed. God has been patient with you, but there will be that day when we'll come to the fulfillment of time and Jesus will return and he will usher in his kingdom and he will judge the living and the dead. So what do we have in that little pinstripe of life on that cable of eternity. We have a few short years. And whether you live to be three or 103, it's shorter than what God intended because God created us for eternity. But in those few short years, 30, 50, 80, 100 years, what do we do with that time? You know, we will worship better in heaven than we do here. We will study God better because we won't have his word, but he will be there because we will be with the word, Jesus. There is only one reason that God has left us here is that we might join him in his mission to seek and save the lost. That our friends, our family, our neighbors, our relatives, they might know the love of Jesus come down to earth, the greatness, the vastness of God wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he leaves us here that we might love one another and join him in his mission. If you're here today, the question is, have you received his love, accepted his payment on the cross for your sins? If that's true, have you joined him in his mission to seek and save the lost. What an amazing love it is that God has shown to us. What an amazing love it is that we, opportunity it is that we have to share God's love with others. And when we love one another, his love is made complete in us. In other words, it is, the picture is clear about who God is. That's how much we're supposed to love one another. Would you pray with me?
Lord, I pray for the picture that we're painting. I pray that when people look at us, our Savior's Baptist Church, Christians, that they would see love for one another that paints a picture of who you truly are. For any in this room today that maybe don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who have not received Christ's atoning sacrifice payment for their sins on the cross, I pray that today may be the day of their salvation. I pray for, of, for those of us who do know Jesus, that in him we would find our meaning, our purpose. But, but most of all, Lord, may we just know the love of God in a very real, tangible way. I imagine there are some in this room today that feel like you are far off, that you're still out there at the uttermost parts of the universe, distant, but Lord, you are not limited in space. You are close by. And just as the lilies of the field are clothed and the birds of the air are provided for, you provide for us and you care for us. And may we see your provision as a gift from you. May we celebrate your love today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.